Hello everyone, my name's Amanda and Parong is here as well. So um, Parong, why don't you introduce yourself? Before I started this role, I was with the Theological Concerns Department and part of my job was to find people who had interesting things to say about society and life and I so Amanda and I thought that she was one of such a person. So I approached her during the GA and I asked her about her interest in working together for a book. Um, and this is where we are today. It's, it's a journey that has happened through a few years now and I'm very proud that we are at this stage. So I, I have a husband and I have a child. I'm just checking what else I'm supposed to say. <laughs> I have a little toddler who is about... Um, 20 months old so he's very cute and he's in childcare now so that gives me time to and space to think about other things um yeah so i feel very blessed and privileged and i wanted to use in some ways the platform that i have been given to also uh, spotlight on an issue that i think is very important men and women working together i see that my dear colleague and partner in crime right now brian is also online and in many ways i think we personify the yin and yang, the black and white, the male and female in partnership working for God's kingdom. So um, yeah, I'm happy to have him around. I'm happy to have all of you around and I look forward to a good time together. Thank you. Aaron, can I just ask you why you thought this was a good idea for a book? <laughs> and women working together. Um, I, I think some of you might know the context of Singapore. We are a tiny little country in Southeast Asia. So um, where I come from, I am Chinese, um, by or, um, or rather I have Chinese ancestors. So in many ways, I'm a very privileged person living in Singapore. And I went to a girls' school for like 10 years of my life. So men were irrelevant, maybe besides my father and my brother, but really they were not very exciting for me. I did not understand in many ways why, um, or that women were not as privileged or as seen as an equal as, as it's happened in some parts of the world. And so when I started work and I started working with World Vision and many other places, people look like me, yeah, but they do not have the same kind of rights, um, aspirations. They are not allowed to do what they want to do just because of the sex that they were born with. And that made me very sad to say the least. Um, and on one way, I want, on one hand, I want to give back. On the other hand, I also want to, to think together with all of thinkers where theologians are supposed to think about God and society, how we can contribute positively to um, women, you know, women um, empowerment, women in society, women who can work together with men for God's kingdom. And so this is something that is very dear to my heart. And I guess as a theologian, we try to approach things by writing books. So that's one reason why a book project always sounds fun. Um, but I think another reason would be just because it extends to more than like a webinar now. You know, people can pick it, a book where and where, wherever they are in a plane or somewhere else. And sometimes a few years later, the book continues to exist when we are no longer talking about the issue. So for me, that was an interesting way of reaching the topic. Mm. Yes, I found it interesting that um, a young guy who's a great social media influencer that I know and, and communicator, he said, Amanda, a book is a good idea. You know, we're so, we're so full of sound bites and short things. Actually writing a book that, as yeah. Perong, you say, you can put it, pick it up, put it down, you can mark in the, in the margins. It's, it's old fashioned, but it's actually really effective. So um, thank you, Parong, for pursuing the idea and for helping us to get there. And um, just one more question about the title. I think it was you who came up with the title in the end, Parong, co-workers and co-leaders. Um, why, why that one? Um, I think we were looking for a title where words were not... Um, that will make people think, you know, we didn't want to use any words that people already have a preconceived notion of the word, like equality, like um, leadership, you know, we wanted something that, that made people wonder, I wonder what this book has to offer. And we are, we are core, so there is a, there's a certain equal platform to it, but we are also not 
Um, so there is a certain hierarchy that we're trying to suggest is there or not there. And also we take different roles, but our value is not in the role that we take, but who we are in Christ. Um, and I think that was also a very important thing that we wanted to bring across that we can be workers, we can be leaders, but together we all belong to Christ. Thank you. But welcome everybody again, if you're just joining, um, we're here to hear more from four of the contributors to um, this book, co-workers and co-leaders. I'm gonna put in the chat how you can get hold of the book later, but it's not just about the book, it's about the ideas and the fact that we wanted, as Perong says, to talk about the issues of men and women, women and men, boys and girls, um, their roles, their giftings, what they are or aren't allowed to do in church. We just wanted to talk about it in a different way, in a more inclusive way, in a less confrontational way, if you like. And we hope, if you've already dug into the book, that you agree that we've achieved that in a little way. We're going to hear from four people this afternoon. Um, and we're going to start with Perong. Each of them wrote a chapter in the book. And um, I hope you agree that they've got really interesting ideas. So Perong, do you want to start us off? Uh, but before we start us off, I should ask you to introduce yourself to maybe oh. any of us who do not know <laughs> us. <laughs> I, I think that everybody might know you, but just uh, okay. in case Sorry, yes. video goes somewhere else that people do not know who you are. You, Sorry, you are my name's Amanda people. Jackson and I live in London in the United Kingdom. I'm also Australian. Um, and have still spent more time in Australia in my life than I have in the UK. Um, uh, I head up the Women's Commission of the World Evangelical Alliance and um, various other things as well. So Amy is on the call today and we work together in a network in the UK for women in leadership called Curia. Um, so I'm involved in quite a few things, mostly to do with women. And it's fantastic that my boss is here, actually, Esme, um, is on the call this afternoon. And she is a woman who has lived and breathed um, serving God and leading for God all her life. So, yeah, I've, that's my role. And I guess my passion is to see the women that I meet around the world confident in using their gifts, in understanding who they are in God and not being, feeling that they're crushed or feeling that they're angry or feeling that they're frustrated, but feeling empowered and gifted and loved. Perron, do you want to start your presentation? Uh, um, just a word regarding structure. I think we talked about the fact that I would have a four minute time to say something and then we have four minutes of um, engagement so I don't think I'll need four minutes maybe I might need four and a half but um, what I'm trying to say is what you have to say is way more important than what I have to say because it's all in the book now and you can all read it um, but just some thoughts about why this chapter because you can imagine that between Amanda and I we figured out who's going to write what and what to write so I had anything I could write anything about anything and I chose to write about um, the mission of God because I think firstly um, it gives us an understanding who God is you know why is this even interesting or why are we even having this conversation is very much linked to who our perception of this God is um, so I wanted to bring across the concept firstly that God is a, a God that is for us a God that has a story. It's not just a set of rules. It's not a dogma, not a doctrine, but he has a story that we are part of. Um, this is also a God that cares for who we are. It's not a God that was um, only in the past, a history, but he continues to be in our present and in our future. Um, he's beyond time. Um, so yeah, so um, in this chapter, I talked a bit about Sorry, someone is leaving the apartment. Um, but yeah, in this chapter, we talk about um, how we, sorry, husband is running around disturbing me. 
Yeah. So in this chapter, I talked about how it looks like participating in the mission of God as an equal partner. And I pointed out the four different ways that we can think about the mission of God as a narrative. So that starts from creation, fall, redemption, and hope. Um, we all know this. We should all know this, I would assume. So it's not fun for me to um, go on for to you. But maybe just a few key points that I was reminded of when I wrote this chapter. Firstly, we were created in relationship. Our role is not individual. I cannot be who I am without everybody around me. Um, we are together, men and women, um, our parents, our children, we are all in community. The mission of God is one that is of a communal interest. It's not just an individual. At the same time, we are also responsible for each other. I have a personal responsibility for the other. It's not a matter of we are in community and therefore I become a minion, but it is we are in community and therefore I'm responsible for each other. I'm created um, as Adam is created or as a man is created in God's image. And it is in God's image that I take my reference as to what it means to be human. Um, however, we all know that there is the fall and fall has distorted the way we work together. Um, what it means to work with a man for me, what it means to uh, relate to a man um, and all the different things that it can come across where the women are only seen as childbearing vessels or seen as sex symbols. Um, but I am very excited whenever I have people in my life who see me as a human. Um, I, when I was in, um, in my school, my theological seminary of faculty, I had a very, very cool professor that was in many ways, I think he envisioned it for me, he was very much, very Christ-like. But one day we were both left in the building doing some work, I don't remember what. I was part of the faculty supporting the Leadership Institute and it was time for dinner. But so we have been sitting in this room working together, but then he's like, I'm so sorry, but I cannot have dinner with you because you're a woman. So he just disappeared for dinner. And then I was left and I'm like, that's okay. I have no problem there. But at the same time, it was very funny to me because I know of um, the other people in our lives who had, um, who were probably more dangerous to him as a man than I would be as a woman, right? So it was a strange situation. And so in this kind of relationships, I, I feel on one hand, you treat me like an equal, you have no problems de dealing with me as a human being. But at the same time, we all come with our pre preconceived ideas on what we should do with the other that I think we should sometimes think about. Um, Redemption, I talk about um, the fact that the reign of God is not an abstract concept, but it's in the person of Jesus. We can know what does it mean when your kingdom come by looking at who Jesus is. Um, yeah, and Jesus or God's purpose is not for some, but for all, and he invites all of us to participate. Um, and so we respond to this world in the likeness of Christ. We cannot do it by ourselves, um, but we can only do it through Christ. And when we participate, I talk about two ways that a woman is unique in its participation. Firstly, by our very clear um, understanding of what it means to be the other. Secondly, by also understanding what service is and that we care for the other. And so, and that is where the power comes from. The final part I talk about is hope. We all need hope. We all have seen very devastating situations in Afghanistan the last week. And I was, and my husband works for an NGO that had a women's project just six months before this happened. And so you can imagine, and it was a Christian NGO. So you can imagine these women are all now like, uh, can you get me out? Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure if they were managed, they were able to get out. So I've been dealing with this. Is it our fault to have a women's project in Afghanistan, knowing that we cannot protect them in this lifetime forever? You know, we were, we were based, uh, we based our understanding on the fact that there will be this superpower, Americans, the whatever, the West to take care of them. But, but in many ways, this is just an illusion. You know, our, hope rests in this God that 
has his own plans that, that transcends ours. And, and even if these people are not saved and they in many ways cannot protect it because of our actions, are we able to still recognize that God is to be praised and that we have to give him glory? And so I, I, I talk, I mean, I think that there is something that we can think a lot more about how this future hope grants us strength to do the work that we do today. We all in many ways face um, people who are persecuted for their faith. And I see some faces here that I would assume have that as their daily lives as well. Um, it would be interesting to think about and to pray and to be together to think about how we can nourish the strength that comes from the hope that comes from Christ. Yeah, so this is basically a little blurb about what my chapter is about if you rather a soundbite. <laughs> so thank you everyone. I look forward to your comments. Thank you so much, Perong. I just have one question and please everyone, um, there will be lots of time at the end for comments and questions and all oh, but have you thought about and all that sort of thing. So please put them into the chat now and or as we go along, mull them over. Um, uh, what people have said, but Perong, one of the things you said in your chapter, which you hinted at in that last little section as well, is that if women experience brokenness or um, suffer in because of their sex, um, that actually that can be a catalyst for something positive, for positive change. Um, do you, can you just sort of draw that out just a tiny bit more? So I, yeah, I, I mean, in a short nutshell, I firstly disclaimer, I don't want to say that we should all want to play the matter. It's not fun to be the victim. And I don't think that we should be the victim. We should always remember that we serve a God who is victorious in the end. Yeah. But having said that, I, I gave a little thing during the European Alliance um, GA about being an Asian woman and young, living and working in the premise of European's ideological world. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not an old white man. I am the antithesis of the old white man. And what did, does that look like? And how that gives me a lot of empathy and a lot of understanding of what it means to be the other. And I think that we all in many shapes and forms, I would assume, can identify with people who do not always fit the norm. And, um, and this is what I mean by how we can therefore use that for the good. You know, There are many people who cannot speak for themselves. Um, and I hope to be a channel for, to be able to speak for people who can't speak for themselves because I can, I can immediately understand what it might be like being them because I look like them. I have the same kind of worldviews that I was brought up with and so on and so forth. Mm. That's really interesting. I, I know I can't see every face on the screen, but um, the ones I can see, I can already see people who are doing that already, who are voices on behalf of people who perhaps don't have a voice because they understand what it's like. They're not just, um, you know, well-meaning Westerners, you know, trying to, <laughs> to have sympathy. They actually do understand. And I think that's really important for women to to know that we've been given, um, if we are blessed with having a position of influence, that um, we have a responsibility and a voice. And I think Jane mentions that in his chapter as well, actually. So thanks, Perron. Um, that's fantastic. Um, our next speaker was meant to be Samuel uh, from Nigeria, and somehow he has not been um, able to join us. Hopefully he might turn up. Who knows what the power situation is like or the internet situation is like where he is. Um, ah, having said that, he has just joined the call. I think I won't put him straight in the spotlight though, um, because that might be a bit, um, he might need a bit of time to just uh, get used to the call. So we'll come back to Samuel. And I'm just wondering if I could ask Evie to step in and speak second. One of the things the book does is to have nine stories from across the world um, about personal stories that also link into theology, perhaps, or um, leadership style, but are based on personal experience. So 
Evie is one of those, and she's going to talk about her experiences over the last 30 years or so um, in what, what she's learned, as she said on her screen, about men and women co-working. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda. Can you hear me fine? Yes. yes. Okay, super. Yeah, I'm very privileged uh, working with many women and men together uh, since many years. And I have personally not uh, felt much discrimination. But of course, there have been situations I've been really hurt. And uh, some, of it some of it has lingered in my heart longer than I wanted. But I, I love to share some of my uh, own experiences in that and also some of the strategies I have learned. I would be very happy to hear about some of your additional strategies you might have. Um, and so uh, let me rush through some of my uh, own learnings here in that um, being a woman and also being single and in leadership has sometimes been a very interesting mix. So let me start with the first one. It is so highly important and I think I'm tying this in with your sharing Perong about you know the mission of God it is so important to know who you are and what your stand on theology is you don't have to agree with my theology but it is super important to know where do you what 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 foundation you know do you have um, and so I'm encouraging all of the churches and ministries I relate to and saying it is so important for us as women also to know um, where we stand you know that wanted to be you know in a leadership or not and say so my dad has got seven daughters uh, bless him and he's got one son but you know he was always very very encouraging and he never judged us because of our gender and that really has been absolutely powerful and has empowered me only when I got later like you know when I was 25 and I finished my theological degrees and so on people would come up to me men and women saying you know you're not allowed to do that you can't do that um it is not right so knowing who God has made me to be and understanding my theology helps me so much then to engage and reflect with others so knowing that gender should not define what I do, but I strongly believe that only God should be my limitation in that regard. And so knowing, you know, and, and even understanding some of the difficult scriptures and how, you know, do we understand them. So you can't have not a theology. Um, you need to be sure what, what you're believing in and why. Otherwise, I realize that I'm always tossed um, to and fro. Um, the second one which is uh, very important, maybe um, with women especially, I'm not sure, but that we know how to deal and cope with jealousy. Um, there are always people uh, in ministry or not, sometimes it's the wives or whatever, who are jealous of what I might do or what I'm allowed to do. And even the single, sometimes I have more liberty or more freedom or more time at hand, it seems. And so understanding who I am in Christ um, and then, of course, dealing with all the vulnerability in the situations where I, I'm stuck in and where others, you know, perceive me as a threat or I perceive them as a threat is super important to, to, un to understand and to cope with. And we need mechanism and the mechanisms for this. The third one, which uh, has become very important to me is I'm, you know, we are all value driven. So the way I want to relate to women and men first is, you know, everyone is, is treated with dignity and respect. I want to create an environment where everyone is accepted and where we respectfully engage with each other. You know, how do we, do, you know, engage and uh, even criticize and whatever. Um, these are, this is very, very important to me. And also understand that someone else in the room has a different position and also might have a very different theological view. I want at the end to leave everyone, you know, in the meeting saying, you know, we have treated each other equally and we are driven by our values. And I feel that, you know, being value driven here, it always pays off. Sometimes it takes longer than I wanted it to be, but it pays off. Sometimes I've had a few men and women, you know, after some years coming to me and apologizing also for their behavior, not um, treating me respectfully and I think we as leaders we need to lead by example here. The third one is show grace 
and forgive. Working with each other at a cross gender can be sometimes very, very stressful. And I would think, I think some of us have been writing this in the book, you know, that it is learning a new culture and a new language sometimes. And it takes time and it takes humor to laugh about yourself. And it is especially, I think, that grace. And the grace we have received like crazy from God. There is plenty to draw from this world. And so when things are unfair and I feel neglected or overseen, it is also extending grace and saying, I forgive consciously. And also, even if I don't feel like it, you know, it is, you know, maybe being pushed to the side or say, it is always again, extending grace. And of course, there have to be situations when things have to be addressed. And the other thing which has become super important is building healthy relationships that, uh, that you know, I, 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 what, what you were just describing, Perong, you know, I can't have dinner with someone or what, you know, I try to have very healthy relationships as a single with men and women, sometimes with couples, some just with the men, some just with the women, but it's building these healthy relationships, which helps me to function well. Uh, and also, I often find that the, the topics the men are interested in, these are also my topics. So it's not just, you know, a gender driven thing, but I actually think it's super important. I don't want to talk about cleaning all day when I'm interested in the leadership development and whatsoever. And I think for me, that has been super important to have a framework for these relationships and know my boundaries how far can I go and how far can I not and it has been absolutely life-giving the other one which I find super important as a woman in leadership having someone walk alongside me it can be some as a man it can be some as a woman um, I've tried to find female mentors in leadership but it has been very very hard as most of you probably I can identify with and I've had incredible guys walking the journey with me some of it has been so painful as a leader and I wouldn't be here today, nor in ministry, if it wouldn't have been for some of these men walking alongside us. And we need these guys also in meetings to cheer us on. I, we have, a, you know, we talk about godfathers and godmothers. Could we sometimes, you know, have even godfathers in meetings saying, you know, we particularly encourage women um, and say, you know, actually your voice matters. And often women are more quiet in meetings, but actually your voice matters. You haven't spoken up yet. What is your opinion? What do you think? So cheering women on is super important. And especially for that part, we still need men, especially to do that for us. The other thing is do not put women alone somewhere in meetings and so on. So that, you know, not to be on a committee on your own to be the token woman, you know, and then do you think you have to do serve the coffee or not? And is that you? But it's always good to have at least a pair of women, you know, in various forces, task forces, committees, and so on, to join the leadership. So it's not just about gender issues. And Daniel Strickland very much describes as it says, if you have two, at least two women in a meeting, it neutralizes all these gender issues and no longer it's about that. And because we need, we women must find it harder to get used to our roles and, and actually enjoy them. The last one is say goodbye to perfectionism. You know, working together can be sometimes very challenging. And as women, maybe, you know, challenging, you know, the pressure of doing everything, household, children, ministry, leadership, and so on, except that we, that 80% is good enough. As Craig Rochelle has said in his, you know, get more principle, 80% is good enough. And so just give your best, be excellent what you do, but also say goodbye to perfectionism. So this is my, uh, my eight short strategies. I think I muted Amanda. Thank you so much, Evie. There were um, so much, so many um, uh, points there. I'm just going to go through some of them, or all of them, actually, again. And I would love people, if you're taking notes, to make sure that you've um, got some of these written down, especially the ones that are speaking to you, because Evie is a mentor to many, many young people across Europe. And um, so she's learnt these things and passes them on. So I, the first one was about theology. The next one was dealing with jealousy, um, showing respect and dignity, showing grace and forgiveness, building healthy relationships, 
finding someone to walk alongside you. Don't put a woman alone in a, an, in a situation or a role and say goodbye to perfectionism. I quite like that one. I think a lot of people on this call are probably perfectionists. So it's nice to hear that we don't have to be um, because God can make up for our deficiencies. So um, I, I would love you to put in the chat if any of those points mean something especially for you. Um, and uh, right now, if you, if you want to put anything in the chat about what Perong has said or Evie has said, because we're going to come back to these points. And uh, before we ask Samuel to speak. But Evie, I just have one question for you, and I'm I'm afraid I can't I can't seem I don't seem to be able to put my um, screen onto spotlight. But there you go. Um, I there you go. I did. Um, you seem to me, Evie, to be a confident woman, outgoing, and you know sure of yourself. I am quite an introverted woman, and uh, it took me a long time to grow in confidence. Do you think, do you think that, um, I don't know, how has God worked on your character? Were you always, did you come fully formed um, <laughs> under, your, <laughs> under your father's oh, enthusiastic oh, support? <laughs> um, how do you see God, you know, what's just one or two things where God has really worked on you to develop character? Because it seems to me that there's a lot of talk lately in leadership about the fact that Men in particular uh, become celebrity leaders um, because they're good preachers or they're good talkers or they're good looking or, you know, um, and they don't have the character um, to go with the gifting and the talent. So I'm just wondering how God has built your character. Mm. I know that's a big question, but yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, totally. But I just think totally it's a process, and you know, and and depending on the day, you would find me also on the floor, you know, feeling inferior. It really depends on the context, you know. Um, but I think what I've learned as a child that um, you know, being dependent on God, and it has been tested many times. Um, one thing which has really spoken to me is that God is not asking me of doing incredible things, but he's just asking me to be, to be faithful. And so no matter what I have done, you know, if I've been on big stages or not, it is always about being faithful to what God has given to me. And so, um, and I have to say that all the things I've done, I would have never actually entrusted them to myself. I needed people to actually broaden my horizon, my vision, believing in me when I didn't. And so I think having a mentor walk with me, you know, people cheering me on has made the biggest difference ever. So I'm not as confident as I would be sometimes, but because I'm more confident today than I am because you know, getting to understand God better and having people saying, actually, you can do that. And then I step into the next bigger shoes and actually I grow into them. I think, wow, it's actually possible. But I never forget where I come from and knowing that, you know, nothing counts as much as being a loved child by God. Lovely. Thank you. Amy has asked a, a really good point. We're going to come back to it, though, Amy, because I'd love to hear from Samuel and Jay. Um, but a really good point about um, some, it's great to recommend that we have, have more than one woman and we are beside each other, but it doesn't always work out like that in practice. So let's come back to that one. Samuel, welcome. Um, Samuel is from Nigeria, from the, one of the big public universities and uh, is a senior lecturer. I think that's your role, Samuel, um, in theology. And you're going to talk to us about the importance of reading the Bible in context and reading it carefully, which I guess links to Evie's really great point about knowing what you believe, um, or at least knowing most of it and being willing to change the other bits. Samuel. I focus on Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. From my own um, scholarly work, which is trying to reinterpret or properly put scriptures in the, in the appropriate context. And looking at women persecution, we have talked about persecution of women, maybe from the angle of um, during war, during battles, but we have found that there are certain form of persecution 
going on in our ecclesial, ecclesial context of women, there are certain attitudes and practices that subjugate or demean or denigrate women. And even at times within the church context, we have used certain Bible verse to, um, to dehumanize women in church. And I focused on Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, where Paul said there is neither male nor female. There were three basic categorizations that Paul mentioned in Galatians 3.28. There's one that relates to ethnic. There's another one that relates to race. Then there's this one that relates to gender. And so Paul was saying, due to our participation in Christ, the, the feminism of being baptized into Christ, everyone is equal before God. And you know, our, our uh, interpretation of this text and some of that text that denigrates women in the Bible has made us to give, um, to give roles to women that dehumanizes them and does not allow them to be strengthened enough as, uh, in a way, we incapacitate women and they don't function very well in our ecclesial, ecclesial context based on our misinterpretation of some of these polite texts. But in Galatians 3.28, this polite paradigm tries to say, look, all our patriarchal um, methodologies and methods. So what I was saying is that in Galatians 3.28, when we look at the contextual interpretation of Galatians 3.28, Paul was trying to say there should be no distinctions between men and women, male and female in the church, belonging to Christ has removed those barriers that denigrate women. And we know the context with which Paul was addressing is also a context that is fully patriarchal. It's a patriarchal society, a society that elevates men more than women to the extent that when censor is going on, they will not count the women. And when we bring this kind of mindset or attitude to the church, it, it robs us of the blessings, of the entire blessings that God has put within the body of Christ. And Paul was emphasizing that our sonship in Christ has given us the freedom that releases all categories of persons to be fully integrated and involved in God's work in the world. And so through our baptism in Christ, that is belonging to Christ, every distinction, all societal distinctions should be removed. Paul is not saying, he's not trying to deny gender differences. But he was, he's trying to say, look, whether male or female, we have the capacity to be all of who and what God wants us to be. And when male and female cooperate together within the context of their, their spiritual giftedness, we will we will operate fully as God wants us to operate. And we will get the best of the results that we should get. And so Paul was saying, women and men have been given a new and equal status, an exalted status before God. No one is inferior to the other. And what we need to do in the church, having known the appropriate contextual interpretation of what Paul was saying in Galatians 3.28, what we should not emphasize in church is inclusiveness. There should be no categorization with respect of ethnic, social, and gender differences. What we should negate all of these distinctions and then focus on inclusiveness. In a sense, our theology of worship and ministry must match our theology of salvation. If God says, no matter who you are, no matter your gender, you are equal before me. Then within the church, which will also translate to our oppression outside of the church, within the church, as we worship, as we minister, men and women can and should minister together. This calls for gender inclusiveness in the ecclesial context. So in Paul 3, in Galatians 3.28, Paul was saying there is neither male nor female with respect of our belonging to Christ, everyone 
based on the gifted of the giftings of the spirit have the equal right to function in ministry and when we allow men and women to function then the the work of christ will move on very fast and very far thank you and um very emphatic saying that we sometimes bring our cultural understanding and background to our faith and to our work in the church and you're saying we need to let all of that go not just around men and women but around all sorts of barriers and distinctions that we might make and it's interesting that Samuel you're not the only one who brought out that point in the book there are a couple of other writers as well who said God's message is much more radical than we sometimes allow it to be um, and Jay I think will be Touch, touched on that in his chapter as well. Samuel, you give um, a list of great action points and we put them at the end of the book. Um, so if you get the book, download it or buy it, make sure you go to the action points, which uh, are really a compilation of Samuel's suggestions for what we can do to change things, to change inequality. And uh, Samuel, just one tip that you have with your students what's the biggest barrier that you want to that you have to overcome with them when they come into your classroom thinking about men and women what's the biggest barrier that you find that you have to overcome in your students thank you amanda one of the things i've known i've, I've found out over the years teaching in the university for close to 13 years is that the cultural norms that many of these uh, young people have lived with, the attitude they have seen played out even within their parents, within their immediate environment, they bring it to the classroom, they bring it into the university. You see them, you see that when they make jokes, when they want to even sit, the males will want to sit um, in, in better places than the ladies. And so what I do is this, and in most of my classes, Christian theological classes, we have very minimal females. So I always give the best seat, first and foremost, to the first female that comes into the class. I make sure that whoever harasses that female is given a, photo, a, 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 a type of mild punishment, like standing up, like saying you will not talk for 10 minutes, trying to change that attitude, that mindset that you must give that female a voice and I give them illustrations about my relationship with my mom give them illustrations about the relationship between my dad and my mom we, we, we grew up not even knowing who was bringing money to the table and so when we also enter into our theological discussions I, I, I engage some of these their, um, ethnic con constructs that is not based on um, appropriate biblical exegesis. And we discuss them. Many of them change their attitude. Some you may never know. And we also try to look at practical examples on how they, like for example, one of my PhD students is working on pastoral ordination of women. And I have two other people who are working on um, issues with respect to women. There's this woman who is working on the ordination of women. The Christ Apostolic Church does not ordain women but these same women will, will go and clean the altar. They won't even allow women to come into the altar. So through en encouraging students to, to take on research work um, in biblical exegesis, in theology, to engage those con constructs that have been for long entrenched in their churches is also one of the ways I'm trying to engage these issues. Thank you. Samuel, that sounds really exciting. I think you, you uh, must really challenge those students when they work, work, walk in. And thank you so much for joining us today. We'll come back with more questions, I'm sure, or comments, but very practical little um, tips there for how to overcome a bit of um, classroom um, misogyny. Jay, it is very early in the morning in New Zealand, and I know Brian is with us from New Zealand as well. Thank you so much for either getting up super early or not even having been to bed yet. Jay Matenga is the head of the Missions and Evangelism Group 
in the World Evangelical Alliance. And he, we asked, Perong and I asked him to do the difficult bit of wrapping up the whole book and thinking of some ways forward. And we would just love to hear some of your thoughts, Jay. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. It's a privilege to be here. And it was a privilege to be invited to, um, to participate in the book. Um, Samuel and I represent the other side of the coin in terms of partnerships uh, and co-working and um, co-leading in this. And uh, alongside others like uh, Andy Dipper and, um, and Andrew Bartlett, we've sort of tried to bring a more male perspective in here, but also conscious of the need to uh, create space. So I'm going to delve into that a little bit, touch on some of the themes in, in my chapter, which will build on what Samuel has already said here. O kia ora me te aroha ki a koutou katoa i roto i a karaiti ihu. So warm greetings of life and loving kindness to you all in Christ Jesus. And um, I come to you, it is 1.50 in the morning here. So Brian and I are doing the hard yards, somewhat indicative of the New Zealand uh, attitude towards championing women in leadership. I think we have a very different context in Nigeria. But Mao Zedong is uh, quoted as saying that women hold up half the sky. And in the context of his Marxist ideology, it's safe to, it's a safe bet that he was thinking in terms of women being a valuable economic resource toward greater production. But I want to be careful to establish from the outset that that is not what is foremost in my mind when I think of the collaborative relationship that men and women share in God's economy. Miles' view was not a biblical one. Uh, in the biblical perspective, humans are not valued for their labor or contribution towards the end of a goal of production. We're precious because we're made in the image of God. Every one of us, regardless of race, religion, or rank in society. The starting point for any theology of humanity, or the mission of God for that matter, must acknowledge the Imago Dei. We are, without exception, people who God loves. And this was implicit in the chapter I wrote for co-workers and co-leaders. But to add value to this webinar, I thought it might be helpful to make it more explicit. Believing that we're all made in God's image establishes a foundation from which we can develop a sound theology of the relationship between the male and female uh, sexes in Christ. So when it comes to our interactivity with one another, we take our lead from the interactivity of the Holy Three, as best as we can understand the Trinity, that is. Uh, we, we know they are inseparably integrated, yet unique in their persons and purpose. Well, this really isn't the place to dive into debates regarding the function, the functioning of the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, but it will come as no surprise to the theologians among us or that may be listening eventually to this webinar to know that I do not believe that the Son needs to be subordinate to the Father in order for him to carry out the will of the Father. The fact is we will never fully understand the dynamic, the interactive dynamic of the holy unity. But what Jesus does say in John 17, however, is that we share in that mysterious unity by virtue of our position in Christ as his followers. Being in Christ enables us to fully develop our being in the image of God, which is otherwise stunted by the influence of sin outside of Christ. So in Christ, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit with the ability to reconcile relationships that are negatively affected by what I call our will to knowledge. Uh, it developed that in the chapter a little more. This is the ability to determine what is good and what is evil, evil independently of God. Well, in Christ, the judgmentalism that creates walls of hostility due to our differences, it's neutralized. Black, white, rich, poor, male, female, we all become partners with God together, fully reflective of God's multifaceted glory. So for my contribution to this webinar, I was asked to elaborate on the topic titled, Why Partnership Between Men and Women Works. But at face value, the phrasing, however, makes me feel uncomfortable. Uh, a superficial glance sees it loaded with pragmatic and utilitarian 
assumptions, any industrial assumptions really need a little deconstructing. So here goes, men and women collaborating in Christ for God's glory is not work in the industrialized labor laden sense of the word. In scripture, I don't see God concerned with production. Perpetually reconciled relationships are viable and valuable outcomes in themselves. Our covenantal community in Christ is the telos, the end goal. This is what glorifies God. Any productivity in terms of being a blessing to the community around us is secondary. So when we think of work, don't imagine productivity. Imagine harmony or shalom. We also don't need to frame men and women in collaboration in terms of our respective utility, our usefulness to some predetermined metric. The term partnership really should not conjure images of a team where each player takes their talented contribution and um, heads for the goal, uh, but they're otherwise autonomous from each other. No, we are one, integrated into Christ, not a sum of parts, but an indivisible whole. Our roles are variable, uh, and depending on the talents we're invested with, um, they're always integrated. And maintaining that bond, maintaining that bond is our purpose. It is our end goal. So when the Holy Spirit leads men and women to co cooperate in some collaborative way, we bring all of who we are into the mix for the benefit of whatever reason we happen to be gathered together in space and time. That might be to express our worship, or it might be to build a zero waste, dynamically sustainable habitat. Each contributor has value and brings value, but healthy relationships ought to be the primary focus. What is created when we cooperate for some reason really is secondary to God's economy. So uh, let's recap. We're created in God's image as unique people, persons with unique purpose. Our value is not in our utility, it's in our innate, or it is innate to our being. As beings of value, we are invited to participate in God's covenantal community through Christ. And when we cross the threshold of allegiance, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to contribute all of who God has created us to be to the benefit of God's community in space and time. And we do, as we do so, we build God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So rather than partners, I prefer to explain this dynamic with the biblical term synergist from the Greek synergos or synergeo. Most English translations render this rather inadequately as co-laborer. Synergist, however, is a rich term favored by Paul to refer to those who contribute alongside him in the ministry of reconciliation and the work of the gospel. It's also use of the way Paul and friends cooperated with God in that ministry, as is seen in 2 Corinthians 6, 1. So when Paul refers to the synergists ministering with him, which included women, uh, Priscilla is mentioned among, amongst them, um, they are mentioned with collegial respect and familial affection, like family, brothers and sisters in Christ. There's no hierarchy in the relationship, simply acknowledgement of faithful service alongside uh, one another. So put simply, as human, human beings made in the image of God, men and women are synergists in ministry integrated with one another and with the holy three so that the world will believe and know that the father lovingly sent the son as we see that encapsulated in john 17. so hopefully from that you can see that men and women cooperating as synergists glorify god and the mission of god amen Thank you so much, Jay. Um, that was a, I love that word. And um, perhaps you can spell it for us um, on, in the chat so that people can look it up and find out the richness of that meaning. Um, I'm just, you do say in your chapter in the book, there's a wonderful mix of hopefulness, but also 
um, you do say that we do need to be intentional. We do need to um, make a deliberate decision to champion women or to include them, or as Samuel did, to put a woman in the best seat in the lecture room, that sort of thing. How do you make space for people in the church who may have been overlooked or silenced? Yeah, that's a, that's a very intentional thing. Coming into the leadership of the Mission Commission, particularly, I was fairly determined to make sure we had some gender balance in our leadership. As part of my lead cohort, I call it, as deputy leaders. I have one of them right here in the marvelous Evie. Evie, um, Evie is, I visited her in, uh, in Germany and uh, we had a day around Hamburg uh, just the two of us wandering around the city in which I did a quasi interview and we explored whether or not we could work together and, and uh, I knew of her reputation long before I met her, I knew, probably a decade before I met her and I was very eager to see if this person really existed and so it was such a delight and um, it was a no brainer for me to extend an invitation for Evie to serve, she's already involved in so much leadership but uh, her value to our team is inestimable. So um, it was wonderful that she, she agreed. And, uh, and so now I have five females, five males from all over the world. We try to maintain this balance. So it's, it's intentionally going and looking for those gifted people who fit and can contribute to a team. And uh, my executive coach, who is a female, when she asked me what I hope this lead cohort would achieve, uh, my immediate response to her was very postmodern. I said, I have no idea and I have no agenda. And it's a lot easier to invite people to something, to be involved in something, if you don't have a preset agenda. And so what we're doing is gathering together and that agenda emerges out of the relationships that build within the group. So I start with the people, you know, getting uh, the right people on the bus is um, a common business terminology. And I think that um, it synchronizes very well with, with what we need to do in Christian ministry. We just need to create space for people to serve and give their best gifts. So here's a fairly concrete example. Mm. Can I just ask a follow-up before Perong takes over and introduces Emma? Um, what do you say to them, men in particular, who say, well, I can't find any suitable women. I don't know any. You're not looking hard enough. <laughs> they're everywhere. Uh, they're, honestly, they are. Um, but I say in the book, I confess in the book that I'm probably biased. Um, I'm not sure how strongly Brian will think of this, but in New Zealand, uh, I just grew up with women leaders, a very strongly matriarchal family. Our tribal background has a rich history of women uh, taking control. As a kid, you always grow up and it's the women that actually educate you uh, with a, a, a slap on the head or something when you're doing something wrong. It's that sort of um, respect that you earn. It's, uh, it's part of our, I think it's deeply embedded in our values as a nation now. But um, it, it really does require a little bit of, I think, getting over yourself and, again, making the invitation. Uh, I think this is a, this, it's wise to be uh, cautious and it's wise to be um, uh, uh, def excuse me, it's getting a little late, um, protective of, of boundaries as, as males and females. But that should not inhibit the relationship. And I think um, there's, there's too much fear around it and sometimes that um, things might get out of hand. But the way I work that as, as a male, I'm, I'm conscious of a certain positional power. And Evie can testify to this. I ask what they're comfortable with. I don't presume one way or the other. Are you comfortable with, you know, with me hanging out in, in Hamburg with you and going to a show and, and sitting in a cafe, just the two of us and talking about these things. She was, so we did. With another person, perhaps from Asia, 
that would be a completely inappropriate thing to do and I would need to observe that. So it's allowing the other person to, to uh, present their boundaries and you respect those boundaries as Evie has already said, that respect. And if you cross them and you offend, uh, quick to be uh, asking for forgiveness and you move back and you adjust and it's just a dynamic. It's, it's not a thing set in stone. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to pass back to um, Perong to introduce Emma and everybody's questions and comments. Thank you, Amanda. So we are going to move on to another of our wonderful contributors. She is Emma. I met Emma the same time I met Samuel in Nigeria. Many good things happened in Nigeria. Um, and when I met her, she was um, doing, she was part of the gender and religious freedom consultation. Um, <coughs> Sorry. And it was fascinating for me to meet um, um, Emma because she was leading the consultation and her and her husband was doing, I think, the worship and helping her to do other stuff. And her child was also her daughter was doing something else. And I was watching or observing them working together as a team. So Amanda, uh, no, Emma asked me if I had a specific question to help her out. I told her that that meant that I would ask a challenging question. <coughs> My husband just walked past three like a few minutes ago and he heard what we were talking about. He's like, does partnership really happen between men and women? And he laughed. So my question is, you, you work in ministry with your family very well and in your contribution, you talk a bit about that. Um, I wonder if you can give us some practical ideas of how um, you overcome the different challenges because it's life and it's messy and you know it's ministry, it's everything together. How do you do that on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I think just listening to um, Jay, um, I think w one of the things that uh, I was reflecting on is that your willingness to just get over yourselves and to say, you know, these people do exist, these women do exist. And uh, and for me, um, it is, it's very much about... Um, the give and the give not the give and the take and yet being being courageous to model that which we believe is biblical and uh, we've done that in various situations so we were in Af and Afghanistan uh, when the Taliban were, were in power 20 years ago so how does a man and a woman who believes that we should work um, be, be, and I love the way you talk about it Jay, you know where, where our harmony and our shalom should be a witness, maybe more than our productivity. And yet the reason we're there is to be productive because we were part of a disaster management team. So what we would do is try and bring in examples forward. And, I, and that seems an extreme example. We were in the, under the Taliban, we'd go and negotiate with Taliban commanders together. I would sometimes be thrown out of the meeting because I was still a woman, but, and I would still be angry. But the fact that we entered together was something that we tried to display. And they might have seen Andy as foolish, but we were thinking, no, we still, you know, try and try and do that. And the other thing we would do is um, I would we'd be interviewing new staff and I would be in charge of the interview panel. And Andy would make a point, my wife is in charge, even though he knew they would know he was a program leader in terms of role, we would give examples of my wife is doing this. And then of course, when you start offering jobs, you know that these Afghan men are not gonna say yes or no, because they're gonna go and talk to their mother first. So it comes back to the matriarchal society that even reflects, even within Afghan society, that the mother is strong which you know, could be reflected in, as we heard uh, with the Kiwis. So when you start modeling these, 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 um, this shalom, I'll, I'll say it, that harmony, and, and people who know Andy and I, we are not a harmonious couple because we are both very strong leaders. So we always know which way it is because it's my way, but he says it's his way. And so we, you know, we disagree because we both have a strategic head and they're not always the same. But in those situations, it is modeling the entry of shalom and saying actually we respect each other in this. And so when our um, third daughter was born, that would not even be announced um, because it was a daughter, it was a failure. And so we had a massive celebration, flowers, cake, um, a talk and everything, invited all our neighbors because we believe we need to celebrate that in that, in that um, way. 
And I'd just like to counter that with, I, I think what we need to say more is how good it is for men to be in harmony together with, with women. And I think we need to celebrate the way that men can be all that God has gifted them to be because of what we're talking about here. Because we have an alpha male um, culture that is rife in the church. That's the toxicity of masculinity in the church, I believe, that's come in. And that is not helpful for our men to be in the image of Christ. And I think we, we, our next challenge is actually to speak about that and to ensure that every man and woman, but I'm talking about men here, have the opportunity to celebrate who they are as a man in Christ. And they can do that with the shalom, the harmony that they can place within community, men and women alike. So I'll just finish there, Prong, if you want to say anything else. Thank you very much. Um, Yep, I, I resonate with that. Amanda, I think we are now at the point of questions and answers. Um, I wonder if any of you are brave, would be brave enough to raise your hands, unmute yourself and say something. Um, or, I don't know, or just put in chat what you would like to discuss. When I finish my thing, my presentation, Grace, I think, brought up the fact that he th she thought it was wise that my... My professor friend basically did not want to eat with me and she asked for what you all thought about. So I have made my point. So I wonder if somebody else would want to bring that up or would want to discuss it. Um, so that's the only question kind of that I see. Any other people? Or maybe Grace, you can share a bit more of what you are thinking. If you would like to. Hi. I think I sorry. No worries. Um, yeah, I guess maybe you know, Peru, you are you're Singaporean and Malaysian <laughs> in general, you know. Uh, there's a tendency to say don't be or try to even if you work together, always be in a group, you know, never be in the same room together. And you go out for a meal with someone other than your husband, you tend to invite. So, I mean, I've always been kind of aware or thought of that because we hear horror stories about then affairs happening and so on. I just thought it's wisdom in general. Of course, there are times when you have to, and I've done work, I, I, I work in a men's world for a full career, I've done that before, but, but I've always tried to apply as far as possible. <laughs> avoid uh, going for meals just with one other person, another, a, a different uh, the meal. So for me, it's kind of wisdom at work. I mean, unless there's practical reasons. That, uh, so that's kind of my point. And I, I see a lot of faces here that come from our part of the world in Asia. So and the Taliban's just said that women can go back to school or university as long as they stay in you know, women's classes slash men's classes. So I wonder if any of you all have a different thought. Um, I think my point is that um, I, I, I agree or I hear the cultural perspective. My question is just when you eat, when you discuss with me alone in a room, how is that? So how have I morphed or changed just when I need to eat? You know, <laughs> it, it, is, it, it continues to be just the two of us. It continues to be in the same context. We're not going out. We're not, we're not inviting gossip. That's what I would imagine my pastor in Singapore would say. But, because, but somehow by the fact that we are eating, it causes a certain conscience to prick. And then they're like, okay, I'm sorry, but bye. I will see you again sometime after we have eaten. And then we'll continue to our work. So am I just somebody that, you work with or am I a human being that is valued for who I am I think it's what my point is but yep I think I saw Samuel's hands a while ago maybe Samuel you have something to say or oh, if not that's fine too can I just add to that as well that um I I do work with mission agencies and I encourage them to um 
think about the way they work with the wives of the pastors. And they have said to me in the past that they do not want to um, challenge um, culture, culture, so that if the women are out in the kitchen cooking this amazing meal and they never see them, um, that's okay because they, you know, they've come to talk about other things like mission or evangelism, and therefore they don't want to challenge cultural norms. Um, but I've said to them, but if the man and the woman are a pastor and his wife and their marriage needs to be healthy and they need to be strong together to carry out ministry and to be a good mom and dad for their kids, um, surely we need to make sure that those relationships are strong and that um, they're both happy with their roles um, and the balance of ministry and family. And so I'm, I'm just wondering what people think about that attitude. Am I being, am I being bullshit? Am I being difficult? I would love to hear some response on that. But first, Samuel, go ahead. I see your hands. I see your hand is still up. About a heart I don't hear you. Talking about <laughs> attitude. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm talking from my own experience here as a pastor of close to 25 years in, in the southwest of Nigeria. You will be shocked um, the kind of attitude within some of our pastor leaders. You will, especially among the so-called Pentecostal tra um, tradition and charismatics. And I, I, I wish this book, this wonderful book, co um, leaders and co-workers could have a version that reaches out to children that we can use in some of us on the school, pictorial descriptions. Because attitude has have gone a long way entrenched in some of uh, our adult life that carries over from the children. And so how are we trying to reach the coming generation with certain models, certain descriptions that will take away this attitude that subjugates women. And our, our advancement in technology and science, you'll be shocked, has not um, done away with some of this until they begin to express. And now you'll find that, oh, you come from this church, you come from this denomination, and you are still expressing a certain attitude that subjugates the women, that does not make women want to run along with the women and with the men. And in a way, we are getting less than we could get in God. So I, I believe we need to reach out to the younger ones, the children, not just the adults. In, in my own culture, there's this saying that someone who is already 40 and beyond is made. And if you try to break, the person is, is like breaking a, 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 a strong fish and to be cracked. So how do we reach out to these young ones so that um, these... Um, things that have been perpetrated attitudinally we begin to remove. One other comment I would like to make is, we, I think we leaders, church leaders, need to begin to adjust um, some of our, our, our long made arrangements in church. For instance, the church I pastor now, there is no different seat for men and women. The woman, the girls, the boys, they can sit anywhere that is comfortable with them. I encourage even husband and wife to sit together in church, except um, where we have um, maybe only one of the partners attending church. There is no difference. And you still find some churches, popular churches in Nigeria here, who have separate seats for men, separate seats for women. So some of these pictures, and the children are picking from some of these ideas and it informs their attitude as they grow up. So church leaders need to change the paradigms of oppression in, in, in ministry, in sitting arrangements, in maybe when we even come to meetings, how much of the women do we allow to speak, to contribute? Do we acknowledge them, their contributions? And finally, we need to bring in this matter Mary model. You know, 
Mary complained about, um, Martha complained about Mary. But Jesus acknowledged Mary and Martha because divine presence was comfortable. Jesus will always visit Lazarus' home because both Mary and Martha functioned in their places. And so we need these models to begin to elevate them as church leaders within our ecclesia context. Thank you. Preach it, brother. <laughs> All right, I see a question from Ashima. Please go ahead. I'll help. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, first of all, I would like to congratulate the team. Thank you so much for recognizing this issue. You know, so importantly, I am coming from India, South Asia, and coming from that context and from and the culture that we are surrounded with all around, that uh, where the women out here are not recognized, you know, we are not educated, we are not well aware of our rights, what's happening around us, and recognize recognizing and this book is so timely where we are not partnering with God when we are working along with them but also partnering with one another on the issues of justice on the issues of uh, equality and um, helping us also to recognize this is not only um, just a book where we are talking about recognizing each other's quality but also it's so encouraging and motivating for us who are working and are engaged in work such as this. And this, this is so timely where we are also being motivated and encouraged as women workers, you know, working for the kingdom. And it feel, it, 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 I feel very blessed. And the other very important thing is that, you know, these are the values. This book is so important because I got a copy and thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing that with me. Because after reading that, just one thing came into my heart was that these are the values that needs to be nurtured. Otherwise, they fall apart. So um, thank you so much for um, the encouragement and the motivation that we've got from this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will let Esme have the last word and then I'll pass the mic over back to Amanda. Thank you. I think this has been an excellent opportunity for us to learn from each other this afternoon. Thank you, Perang, and thank you, Amanda, for taking the time to do all of this and put it together. In the evangelical world, we have struggled with a whole issue of men and women working together. It is something we began to address even in 1997 in the World Evangelical Alliance. And for this book to be showing and coming light now, I think it's just wonderful. So I want to commend you. I want to thank those speakers who have actually contributed. And when I listen to some of the conversations today, I am just reminded of the many things that I have experienced as a woman leader in the world. As an African woman in my society, Ubuntu is something that we take very, very seriously. And that means that we treat each other with respect. When we look at each other, we see Jesus in each other's eyes. And yesterday I was just in a dialogue with a group of academics talking about Ubuntu and what it means to us as Christians today and what it means to women. And so thank you very much. It's something we need to be looking at our relationships how we see each other, and also forgiving those who actually have maybe stabbed us in the back, trampled on our toes, put us down. We need to be gracious. And I want to say to all the women today, let's be gracious, but also let's speak out. I do not believe that we must have our voices muffled. And thank you to everyone who's made a contribution. I think this has been a significant conversation and dialogue. And thank you to the two of you, Perong and Amanda. Thank you so much um, and thank you to everybody. I'm sorry we didn't really get to cover everything, of course, um, but um, let's, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm, <laughs> I can't, I can't get rid of Esme's um, lovely face on the screen and replace it with mine, but um, that's okay. <laughs> um, oh, there we go, I think. Is that right? <laughs> um, so um, uh, thank you everyone for today. I've put my email in the chat. 
If anyone would like a hard copy of the book, this is a once in a lifetime offer, I might add. Um, if you would like to email me, um, then please, I am prepared to send you a copy of the book. But if you scroll up through the chat, you will also see where you can download it or send it to other people to download. Um, so please scroll back up through the chat and copy that and um, you can find the book there. You can also find a short video that you can show to people about the book. It's not the book itself. It's not, you know, getting lots of copies out there necessarily because it's our book. It's the ideas in it. And there are over 18 people who've contributed to the book, which is fantastic. And they are from all sorts of backgrounds. And we are so thrilled that we've had, you know, some of those represented here today from different continents and different backgrounds. But it's 18 people with their stories, their theology, their understanding. So thank you.